apologize for this saying Dakar, but uh, I bust my laptop two weeks ago, and this is the last version of the presentation that I have with me. Otherwise, I would have, of course, updated it to say uh, Sophia. Uh, welcome. This is Juggy, the symbol of Java user groups. How many people here are members of a Java user group? Not bad, but not enough. You have Bulgarian user group, need to join. We'll talk about that later. Uh, alternative title, would you like to have a job 10 years from now? Uh, robots are coming to take your jobs away, and outsourcers are coming to take your jobs to some other country. Uh, I'll talk about how you can defend yourself against this. But first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, my family background is Irish. I was born in England. I live in the United States, and I'm married to a lady from Turkey, so I'm kind of mixed up. Close to home, not, not get a chance to go to Turkey this year, but last year I did from here, because of course it's very close. Um, still a European citizen, despite the Brexit thing, because I have an Irish passport, that's a good thing. <laughs> <coughs> so, I'll be able to travel even after they build a wall around themselves. <coughs> Uh, so this part is obviously the Senegalese bit, never mind that. I love music. Uh, normally I would have replaced this with some Bulgarian music, which I also like, but uh, this is me in Congo last year, uh, where I got to meet some nice people and dance. And in Congo, I speak a little bit of French, but not very much, but uh, all of the taxi drivers were playing rumba music, which I love, and I was able to connect with them because of that. So music is a universal language. So, of course, is technology. Those of us who care about technology get a chance to meet people all over the world, share your enthusiasm with them, you get to make new friends, uh, advance your career, and have fun. Excuse me, I want water. I have a little bottle here. Okay. Uh, one of the... Ay, ay, ay. Sorry. Designed for like a tiny person with a tiny head. Doesn't fit. Okay. Uh, somebody earlier talked about being a dinosaur. I'm a dinosaur too. I've been in the IT business for more than 30 years. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit about what I've learned over that time. I didn't intend to get into the IT business. I was an academic doing a PhD, economic history, political economy. I spent years in a library, underground, looking up data. And in those days, the only way to look up data was, remember card catalogs, those little drawers with bits of cardboard in that listed the books? And you read one book, and if you were lucky, you'd find a reference to another, and you'd go back to the card catalog, and you'd see if the library had it. And after doing that for a couple of years, I thought, this is not the way people will do this in the future. There'll be some kind of magic box, and they will ask questions to this magic box, and they will get answers. So I like to claim I invented the web browser. Uh, so I decided in the end I'd be more interested in trying to help make that happen than in actually writing my, uh, my thesis. Also, this was the Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher years. Margaret Thatcher had just decided that she didn't really believe in education. She cut all the money, so I knew I wasn't actually going to get a job at the end of this period. So I went to what we call a technical school. I learned a program in assembly language and in COBOL and I talked my way into my first job. I was 30 years old at the time. This is the computer that I worked on, at least I think it is. I say I think because I never actually saw it because you didn't see the computer in those days. This was what I saw, it was the punch card machine. So you type your program out, you end up with a stack of these cards. Don't drop them because then you uh, scramble your program. And you take them and you go across to this little window and you'd hand them in to somebody there and then you'd wait 24 hours. And after 24 hours, you'd get one of those sheets of folded green paper with the results of your program and it would probably say, you got a syntax error on <laughs> line three and then you got to wait 24 hours to fix that. So you got very good at debugging in your brain. You know, you have to read your program very carefully and uh, think it out that way because 24 hour turnaround was uh, pretty tough. 
So it's all about choices. My first choice, of course, was to say, I don't want to be an academic anymore. I'm going to get a computer job. My second choice came the very first day that I walked into the, the office, and the manager gave me a choice. He pointed over here, and he said, you can go work with those guys if you like. And they sort of looked like this. They had jackets and ties, and, and they were coding in COBOL on these sheets. You know, you have these 80 characters and so on. I thought, that looks a bit dull. Or he said, or oh, you can go over here, and there was a room full of scruffy looking people with beards and jeans and stuff, and bits and pieces of electronics and single board computers and electro uh, oscilloscopes and all sorts of wires and things over there. And I thought, that looks like much more fun. So I went over there. And they gave me a computer of my own. This is it. Uh, eight kilobytes of memory, one megahertz, not gigahertz, megahertz processor. This is the storage, it was a cassette tape. And uh, not a lot of memory, obviously, so we programmed it in assembly language, <coughs> which if you know anything about Java and Java bytecode, you will recognize this. Bytecode is simply an assembly language for a virtual machine instead of a physical machine. So I was programming in assembly language because we only had eight kilobytes, and every byte counted. So your variable names, if you gave a variable a meaningful name, we didn't do that because every character used up one byte. So you call your variables things like X and Q and W. So the programs were completely unreadable uh, because you had to squish everything in. Um, my second job, one day the boss said, you want to go to, this was a different company, but you want to go to California for a year and work on the word processing system in assembly language. I said, well, okay, never thought about it, but why not? What have I got to lose? That was 1982. I'm still there. I went for one year. And this is the word processor that I worked on, because in those days, a word processor was not on uh, software, but it was a dedicated machine. So this was a CPM machine. It took five and a quarter inch floppy drives. Uh, but this was great. After typing my thesis, several hundred pages on a manual typewriter where the only way to correct it is that white stuff, you know, uh, to be able to redo stuff was uh, wonderful. So I worked on this, but we never finished it because the company was owned by Raytheon Data Systems and they know how to make missiles, but they don't know how to do office automation. So they ran the company into the ground and I got recruited into a company called Interactive Systems. And they were the first company ever to commercialize Unix. And uh, we actually ported Unix to all sorts of different machines. In those days, there were all the mini computer manufacturers, Prime and Data General, and I don't even remember what else. They all wanted their own version of Unix. So we did that, it paid us good money. We ported Unix to the very first IBM PC XT machine, which had only four megahertz processor, 10 megabyte disk, 640K of memory. As Bill Gates once said, who would ever need more than 640K? We managed to get Unix into it, but IBM had no idea how to sell it, despite licensing Charlie Chaplin as the mascot, uh, which was a brilliant move, but still, it didn't sell. And in those days, go back to the music theme for a moment, when I was hiring people, many of the people did not have, as I didn't have, uh, computer science backgrounds, no electrical engineering, no computer science, but I learned that if they were good at music, if they played music in particular, there was a good chance they would make a good programmer. That's an interesting correlation. I guess it's to do with combination of aesthetics. Uh, you talk about an elegant solution to a problem, right? You can have an ugly way to fix a problem and you have an elegant way. Music has that notion of elegance. And then I ended up at Sun Microsystems because Scott McNeely was beginning to get afraid. He always used to laugh at PCs, said they were toys. But in the back of his mind, he knew that they weren't really toys. They were getting more and more powerful, and they were going to challenge Sun workstations. So he said, I better have something in my back pocket. So he bought the company that I worked for so that we would port Solaris, his version of uh, Unix, to, uh, to Intel processors. And I worked on that, and then I worked on kernel, device driver development work, and so on. And this was where I first came across outsourcing because my team, many of my team were outsourced to Ireland. And then Sun changed their mind, dumped us, laid everybody off, and I got recruited again. I managed to find another job inside Sun working on conformance test suites 
for Java. And this time my developers were in Russia, in Novosibirsk and St. Petersburg. The Novosibirsk guys in particular were basically rocket scientists in the Stalin era. They set up this uh, Akadem Gorodok city out in the middle of nowhere and they brought all the professors and the brains out there and gave them special living conditions and extra money and stuff. Uh, and then when everything fell apart, we were able to hire these young people with PhDs in computer science and mathematics and they were working on our test suites. That was great. But uh, anyways, yes, Novosibirsk, so where are they over here? And of course, I was based here, so I like to travel. I was happy to go to Siberia. People thought I was crazy, but I'll go anywhere. And uh, then eventually I ended up running the JCP. So why am I saying all this? I did not expect to be in the IT business. I had planned to be a university professor. If Thatcher hadn't come along, that's what I would be. When I started, there was no laptops, there was no networking, there was no email, there was no bitmap displays, there was no internet, there was no cell phones, and certainly no social media. So you can't predict, you can't predict how things are gonna be five years from now or 10 years from now. You guys are young, so hopefully you will have a 30-year career as I have. The only thing you can predict is that stuff is gonna change and in ways that you don't expect. So what are you going to do about that? How do you plan you, your career? How do you prepare yourself for that change when you don't know what the change is? Here's another example of the change. When I started, you could buy a supercomputer for oh, about 10 million bucks. Don't you love it? It's like a piece of furniture. <laughs> this is more powerful. We're all carrying supercomputers in our pocket. Uh, People didn't predict that 10 years ago. People talked about flying cars and all that stuff. You see, they're wrong. But nobody said you'll be walking around with a supercomputer in your pocket and everybody will be connected to everybody else and there'll be these giant artificial intelligences somewhere up there and you'll look up any piece of information that you want and get an answer in seconds. Nobody had any idea. So, what's your future gonna be? If you're lucky, maybe you'll get a cube somewhere. If you're lucky, maybe they'll pay you. <laughs> I met a young man in Casablanca a uh, week before last. He's had six jobs. Not one of them paid him. Six internships for I don't know how long, a year and a half. So maybe you'll get paid. Maybe you'll have a job. Maybe you'll have somewhere to sit. More likely, you won't have an office because they'll say work at home. Working at home is okay, but you don't want to be at home, you know, seven days a week. You need the social interaction with other people. Um, so, if you do get a job, will you keep it? Or will the company that you work for send it to somewhere else where people earn less money, where it's cheaper? Um, I said my first team was in Ireland, then the Irish became too expensive, so we went to India. Then the Indians became too expensive and too difficult to manage, so we went to Russia. Then Intel hired all my Russian engineers, so we said, okay, well, that's not gonna work anymore. So then we went to China. And now we're back in India, also Czech Republic, uh, and also in China. And I know Eva is hoping to bring jobs here uh, from the US. But even if she succeeds, you know, some point in the future, the more you succeed, the more the wages go up, and the more other companies get a chance to be more, other countries get a chance to be more competitive. So I don't care how smart you are, you're all smart. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. There's somebody in the world who is smarter than you are, or at least as smart as you are, and is willing to work for less money. So outsourcing is another threat to your jobs. And then of course, the robots are coming. They're gonna take your jobs away. In the old days, robots, we, we, those of us who, who work with our brains were kind of complacent and we said, oh, we don't need to worry about this. It's only people who do manual stuff whose jobs get taken over by robots. That's not so anymore. A lot of medical jobs done by robots, uh, artificial intelligences. When I go to the doctor, basically the doctor is following a, a, a kind of predictable algorithm, okay? Run some tests. If the value of this test is, is above so-and-so, then there's a possibility that this is a problem, run this other test. 
And they're either, and sometimes right there in the office, they're looking stuff up on their computer. Well, the computer can do it as well or better than they can. That's why IBM's Watson uh, machine, the one that won Jeopardy on TV, uh, they're dedicating that now to uh, medical technology, among other things. Surgeries done by robots, accounting and tax preparation, real estate, legal discovery, document processing, because of the work that I do, and because Oracle ends up getting sued a lot, uh, they are always taking the contents of my laptop and sucking all my, I'm not allowed to delete any emails or documents because they're always being referred to in legal cases. And in the old days, humans would do that. They'd print out big piles of documents, I mean, literally a room full of documents, and humans would read them. Now it's all done by machine. So don't bet that your job, if you have one, is safe. I was at DevOps in Antwerp last week and there were several presentations about artificial intelligence and one in particular talking about programming and the fact that you know things have progressed from the early days when I was doing stuff in assembly language. No such thing as, as, as libraries or routines. You did everything by hand and today machines can do much of that work and in the future for sure. Just think about it. Think about automation is and artificial intelligence is it's exponential, you know. Uh, so we already have self-driving cars today, five years from now, who knows, 10 years? Whew. So, you might as well go home, you're gonna be unemployed, end of conference. So, what are you gonna do? Think of it as surfing. Uh, I've had seven jobs, I described them, all of them flowed from the first one. I didn't consciously choose any of them. Positions, opportunities presented themselves. So what you've got to do is kind of put yourself in a position where opportunities will present themselves and then you've got to seize the ones that are most interesting and most promising. So like surfing, find a good wave, jump on and go with the flow. Might not take you exactly where you expect it, but it'll be fun. So you've got to try and do that in your work. Also you can think of it as dancing, you know, kind of taking advantage of what happens and moving with the flow and so on. Or teamwork, connect, collaborate, create, make music. So how do you do all this? If you're stuck in a cube doing a boring job with little chance to meet new people or learn new technologies, how do you improve your opportunities? And, and many people, this is the situation. Most people don't design systems. Most people maintain other people's code. I was talking to someone at dinner last night. He was talking about interviewing someone and the guy, and he asked him, why did you leave your previous job? And the guy says, well, the project was finished and I don't do maintenance. So he said, I'm not gonna hire you. I mean, most jobs require that you maintain somebody else's code, so, and it's probably boring code and it's probably doing something not very interesting. Uh, the London Java community, one of the best, most famous user groups in the world was founded people who founded it did so because people in London, a lot of very smart Java programmers there, doing very boring work. Banking is kind of dull. Uh, you know, banking is a very conservative business. You don't take risks. You very seldom create new systems. So most of these guys were maintaining somebody else's boring old code. And these guys said, we need something to wake us up, something to excite us and interest us. So they formed the user groups specifically to allow these people an opportunity to learn new stuff. So you may not, probably won't, get to learn a lot of stuff where you work. If you do, congratulations. But you're going to need to do something outside of your job. And sorry about this, but that means you won't get paid for doing it. After you do your work, at the evenings or the weekends, you're going to be doing other stuff and you're going to do that because that will increase your opportunities of getting paid at all or getting paid more in the future. Increase your opportunities of defending yourself against outsourcing and robots. How am I doing for time here? So this means you've got to get involved. Uh, I don't remember what time I started. What time did I start? What time are we finishing? I know we're already behind schedule. Okay. All right, so a good place to start is join the user group. Uh, this way, you won't be so isolated. You'll be able to work as part of a team. 
You'll be able to work with other people, you'll be able to teach other people, or learn from them, find a mentor, or mentor somebody else. Work as part of a team, much better than trying to do stuff by yourself. And there's a lot of stuff you can do. Uh, you don't have to be a big expert to get started. You could just help organize the meetings. Uh, if you've read an interesting book or found, come across an open source library or tool that you like, you could just you know, write a blog post about it, talk about it in a little five minute talk to the user group, and over time then you improve your communication skills, your organizational skills, and improve your career opportunities. So, volunteer for something. Young people in the United States, when they're leaving school and getting ready to go to college, it's not enough for them to have the scores and the, the uh, examinations that they take at the end of uh, high school. They also have to produce a list of extracurricular activities they've engaged in. What if they volunteered at a local homeless shelter or helping to teach kids or whatever? If they haven't done that, they don't get into college. Same for you, you're gonna to need to volunteer at something. It, it could be almost anything, but since we're in IT business, I'll give you two obvious possibilities. One is to work on an open source project of some kind, and the other is to work within the JCP. Well, since I'm Mr. JCP, I'm obviously gonna concentrate on this, but much of what I say about this would apply to working in an open source community also. So, switching direction. Who knows what the JCP is? Okay, only a few, all right. The JCP is how we develop Java, how we develop the, the formal specifications for the various technologies that make up the Java platforms. Unlike Windows, with Windows, what you get is what Microsoft decides you're going to get, right? Unless maybe you're a billion dollar company and then they may consult you. But basically, it comes from them, it comes from above. Uh, Java is not like that. Java is developed through the community process. We develop Java specifications that we call JSR, Java Specification Request. And we do this collaboratively through a formal process, very similar to the process that's used by other standards developing organizations. And anyone who's a member of the Java community, and a member of the JCP, can participate in this process. So, uh, even though Oracle is obviously the, the, the big gorilla in this business, uh, Oracle's competitors are active participants in this process. So IBM, and HP, and Red Hat, for example, are very fierce competitors of Oracle, but they all belong to the JCP and they take part in this process of developing Java. We also have representatives from the open source community, such as the Eclipse Foundation and a bunch of Java user groups as members. Anybody can join, we've got about a thousand members, there are no fees, about three quarters of our members are individuals, and actually the proportion has gone up since then for reasons I will explain later. 16% uh, or so are corporations, and then we've got a bunch of non-profit organizations, most of which are user groups as members. 40% in North America, about the same percentage in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and 13% in Asia. Okay, uh, we recently made some changes uh, to the way we organize ourselves. So we did this through the GSR process. The GSR process is a way of formally creating a specification. And since we, the organization itself, has two documents that define how it operates, one of them is called the process document, the other is legal agreements. Um, so we use the, that process to modify these documents. So in GSR 364, we said we want to embrace more people, we want to bring more people into the organization. So we created a new membership class we call associate members, specifically designed for individuals, much simpler than the, uh, the process for joining that it used to be. It was a big 12-page legal document, very scary document. Um, with this associate membership, uh, much simpler membership agreement. You don't need to get a lawyer to read it and explain it to you. Uh, with the other documents you actually would need your employer's approval, which is also can be difficult or scary to get. Uh, so you can do all this yourself. Um, one big advantage of, of joining as an associate member is that you can help out with JSRs without needing to spend a lot of time becoming what we call a member of the expert group. 
and you can get formal recognition if you do something helpful and useful. You can actually get your name listed on the, the JSRs page on uh, jcp.org, which obviously is good for your career. If you go in to get, look, get interviewed for a job and the interviewer says, do you know this Java technology? And there's two people there. One of them, both say yes. One of them says, not only do I know it, I help to define it. And if you go to jcp.org, you'll see my name there. Guess which one you'll hire. Uh, the application process is electronic, so it's very simple. You don't, we used to have to download this document and sign it and scan it. Uh, now it's electronic. Um, so there's no reason not to join. It's good for you. It's free. We also don't charge corporations anymore. We used to. And like I said, we've got a whole bunch of uh, user groups as members, including, I see, uh, Bulgaria. Uh, th this is already out of date. Every time I do this slide, I have to shrink the font to add more. We're up to more than 60 user groups as members now. Okay, this is how we're organized. This is me. We have an executive committee, which is like a board of directors. I have a small administrative staff that takes care of maintaining the website and looking after posting materials online and helping the groups that actually do the development work. Uh, the real work is done by what we call expert groups, led by somebody we call a spec lead, typically a, somebody from a corporation, because it's a lot of work. Uh, but they recruit other people to help them, and then the members can participate in this, and they get to vote for the members of the executive committee. Uh, we have elections every year. The elections are going on right now for the executive committee, so this will change. But as of right now, these are the members of the executive committee. And you'll see we've got a mixture of big companies and small companies, individuals, open source people, and two Java user groups, London Java Community, who I already mentioned, and SoJava, which is a big Java user group in, uh, in Brazil. They have more than 40,000 members. Um, so we try to make this, we hope that it's representative of the whole industry. Uh, there are companies there that release their own versions of Java. There are other companies that just consume Java. There are companies in the IoT and machine-to-machine and -machine space and, and so on. And it's all about standards. <clears throat> the world that we live in would not function without standards. Standards define just about everything that there is in our daily life. And there are hundreds of organizations that develop standards, of which the JCP is one. And the kind of standards that we care about, well, excuse me, before I get to that, the importance of standards is they enable multiple implementations of a technology. Uh, when I started, if you bought your first computer from IBM, that was it. They owned you for life. Because the only place you could get peripherals was from IBM. The only place you could get software to run on the machine was from IBM. The only place you could get training was from IBM. The only way you could enhance this machine is by going to IBM. So once they got you, they got you. People don't like that. They don't like to be tied down. They don't like to be tied to one vendor, vendor lock-in, they call it. They like to have a choice. They like to have the opportunity to switch suppliers or to mix pieces from different uh, companies. And particularly people who are building industrial strength systems, global systems, global supply chains, airlines, telecommunication networks, financial networks, and so on, these guys insist on having uh, a choice, and the only way they get a choice is by there being a formal standard, uh, which is free for many people to implement, so there are, they have a choice uh, of implementations. The kind of standards that we care about fall into two categories, one languages and protocols, so the way that we talk to machines and the way machines talk to each other, and the way that software is invoked. Like I said, when I started, there was no libraries of any kind. That little Commodore machine that I worked on, if I wanted to know what somebody had entered a string in the keyboard, I had to go to a particular location in memory and watch what happened. And every time it changed, you grab the value and you say, OK, you translate that into an ASCII value, and you build up the string, and then you pass the string and see if there are invalid characters in it, and so on. So everything had to be done by hand. Today, of course, you can just pull pieces of software off the shelf, and if they're well designed and well documented, you can kind of plug them together. So, standards help here too. Uh, 
don't have to go into the details, but the important point is for each of the three Java platforms, Java SE, Java ME for little devices, and Java EE for big servers, they all have these different components, each of which is well-defined, and typically each is defined by a JSR. So there is a formal specification developed through the process that defines the APIs and how to invoke them. And because this stuff is all defined, it is possible to get implementations of these platforms from different vendors. So a JSR, Java specification request, is just something that defines a particular version of a Java specification. And they're led by somebody from the JCP, we call the spec lead, who recruit other people who are interested in participating into the expert group. And they work together uh, to develop this technology. Anybody who is a JCP member can submit and lead a JSR. Mostly they're done by corporations because uh, it's a lot of work. But we do have a couple, we've had three or four that have been led by individuals. Uh, don't recommend that because it really is a lot of work. You're going to deliver three things, not just the specification, but also two other things. A reference implementation, which means a full implementation of the spec, and a test suite, we call it a TCK for reasons that are lost in time, uh, that can be used to verify that implementations actually do what they're supposed to do, that they meet the requirements of the specification. We build these three things together, makes things kind of difficult because you've got three moving parts, but it's a powerful model because in the process of building the reference implementation, you verify that the spec is actually implementable. Maybe it's ambiguous, maybe it's just missing some information. You'll find out when you try to do an implementation. When you build your tests, you again will find ambiguities in the specification. You'll improve the spec because you provide feedback on the language. And when you run the tests against the implementation, you'll find bugs in the tests and bugs in the implementation. So each of these three things strengthens the others. And when you're done, we take what we call compatibility testing. Other people would call it conformance testing. Very seriously, all implementations of these JSRs, of Java technologies, must pass that test suite. So you've got a, obviously it's never a 100% guarantee, but you have a much better chance of implementations behaving the same, uh, being compatible with each other, because you have a test suite to verify that. And like I said earlier, I used to run before I was chair of JCP, I was responsible for the test suite for the Java ME platform and the Java SE. The Java SE test suite then had 175,000 tests in it. It's much bigger now. And you get a compatibility guarantee with Java. The trademark is only allowed if you are actually compatible and you pass the test suite. So, like I said, I won't go into the details of this, but there is a formal development cycle it's documented in what we call the process document. Starts out with someone submitting a proposal for JSR. Says, this is what I think we should do. Uh, this is why I think it's a good idea, why there is a gap, you know, why there is a need for this. And these are the companies and the members of the JCP who are interested in, in supporting this effort. And then you do one or more drafts. All of this is done in public, by the way. Uh, and then when you're getting a little further along, you do a more formal uh, public review, as we call it. You publish your specification uh, on our website. Uh, the public gets a more formal chance to review it, and then there's a vote by the executive committee. There's a vote on the executive committee at this stage, a public review, and at the end when you're finished. And we have a formal process for maintenance too. And this is, like I said, the same as any standards developing organization. They sometimes use different terms. They will sometimes call these technical committees or working groups, but typically they have a very similar process. Okay, let's go back to getting involved. Remember I said we've got two user groups on the executive committee, London Java Community and So Java. These guys, a few years ago when I opened up the expert group process, before we did that, it wasn't exactly secretive, but, but they weren't very forthcoming, these expert groups. Typically, a bunch of people from the big companies would get together, they kind of go away into a room, and they had an obligation to publish this public review, but it could be months before anybody could see what they were doing. And 
when they did publish the spec, there was no way for anybody to understand why they made the choices that they made. And we said, we're going to stop doing things that way. We insist on everything being done publicly. We want public mailing lists. You must publish all your materials, your meeting minutes, and so on. And when we did that, these two user groups said, ah, now I see ways in which we, the user group community, uh, individual developers, can actually participate. So they formed this program they call Adopt to JSR. And basically this just means that a particular user group, some members of it will say, I'm interested in this particular technology, so why don't we get together, form a little group, and we will see what we can do to, first of all, teach ourselves about this technology, and then we will go to the spec lead and the expert group and offer to help. And the expert groups and the spec leads are very glad to get this opportunity, to get this feedback, and uh, typically uh, very glad to accept the help. So we have an international effort here. Uh, user groups from all over the world have helped over the past few years to develop different versions of Java and Java technologies. Uh, we've had more than, actually it's more than 30 user groups now have participated in this program from South America, from North America, from Europe. Uh, this was written for Africa, so we emphasized Africa, and from Asia. So all over the world, user groups have said, Let's help. Let's get involved and see what we can do to help move Java forward. Um, so a few weeks ago at Java 1, Oracle announced that they were rebooting Java EE 8. So the existing JSRs and some new JSRs will be ramping up very soon. And uh, the spec leads and the expert groups will be looking for help from user groups around the world as they got help with Java EE 7 over the past few years. Um, I won't go into the details of this because it's old news by now, and uh, I think Dave Delabassi is going to be here from Oracle to talk about Java EE. So, um, what can you do to help? Um, you can start simply, so don't be put off by the word expert. Uh, you don't have to be an expert. You can start small. You could help by moderating the mailing lists, or you could do a little bit of evangelizing. You can just talk about this JSR once you've learned about it, and then promote it through social media, through blogging, uh, maybe lightning talks or, or longer presentations. You can help with documentation, maybe translating it into your native language. You could help work with the FAQ. You can help them with the project infrastructure. None of these require any real detailed technical expertise or knowledge of the particular JSR. So like I said, you can start small. But if you know more, or as you gain more experience, then there are more technical, more challenging things that you can do. You can help manage the, the bug list, the issues, uh, reproduce problems, uh, look for duplicates, prioritize, and so on. You can study the JSR and think about how you'd use it in the real world. You can. Uh, take an existing program or library that you have or develop something new to test out these new APIs and provide feedback and report bugs. And in many cases, you can even help with develop the test suite and use that to test the RI reference implementation, or you can help to develop the implementation itself. So a whole range of stuff, and you can start small, and you will learn as you go through the process. The guys who founded um, SoJava, the Brazilian guys, the main reason they wanted to form this program was to provide a way for young developers to grow. And what they were thinking was, there's always going to be somebody who knows a little more than, than any one person, and they can learn from that person. But then as somebody learns, then there will be people coming in who know less than them, and everybody can kind of help each other and gradually work their way up the ladder and increase their, increase their skills. So. Why would you do this? I'm not asking you. Remember, it's just, you're doing this for free, in your free time. I'm not asking you to do it out of charity. I'm asking you to do it to defend your career, to advance your career, to defend yourself against the robots and the outsourcers. You can grow your network. It's why we all come to these conferences, right? To meet other people and to increase our connections, make new contacts, and you will improve what the Recruiters, the HR people, call soft skills. Verbal and written communications, negotiation skills, collaboration, teamwork, and so on. And it's fun at the same time. So, 
like I said, the HR people, you kind of take it for granted when, when you're interviewing. I've been hiring people for 30 years now. Um, and these days, by the way, much of that process is also done by robots. Human beings don't do the initial scan of the resumes. That's all done by, by machine. Uh, so by the time uh, somebody actually makes it through that process and sits down and facing as a human being, uh, you kind of take it for granted usually that they have the technical skills. Uh, and typically what I look for over and above that is what we call soft skills. I remember many years ago when I was doing device driver development, I hired a young woman uh, we, to develop network drivers for, for Unix. She was doing a PhD in networking, computer networking. I thought, oh, great, she's obviously qualified to do this. It was a disaster. She knew how to do the academic stuff, uh, but she was hopeless at actually working with other people and working in the real world. So a lot of that, those skills are not actually the technical skills, but this is a list from, I did a random search of HR soft skills, top 10. Self-awareness, know who you are, know your strengths and your weaknesses. Communication, verbally and in writing. And these days, unfortunately, that means English. Uh, so you need to have good communication skills. Being able to listen and accept feedback. Networking, working with other people, collaborating, teamwork. Uh, managing your time. Uh, being good at meetings, either running a meeting efficiently or know how to participate in a meeting so you don't have 20 people sitting in a room wasting their time. Uh, resolving conflicts, knowing how to push your own point of view where it makes sense to do so, knowing when you should compromise, even if you think you're right, because practically you need to get something done. Solving problems, managing stress, managing your time. All of these skills are skills that you will learn uh, if you participate in some kind of collaborative activity in the IT world, in other worlds too, but, but let's focus on IT. So, uh, if you're working in an open source project, if you're working developing standards, these are precisely the skills that you will learn. And in particular, uh, since a lot of work tends to be done in North America or in Western Europe, this is a good way for you uh, here to, uh, to get involved in this process. And you can do it even if your English is not that great, you can hold your local meetings uh, in your own language and more importantly, you can do it in your own time zone. So even if the expert group is primarily based in US, uh, 10 hours behind, it's now the middle of the night, uh, by the time they hold their meetings, it's evening for you, time, for you guys. Uh, because we can do this in a distributed manner, uh, you can actually, uh, you can get involved um, from here. So I encourage you to do that because if you don't, you won't have a 30-year career like I did. You may not even have a 10-year career. You may not even get a job, or if you get one, you won't keep it. None of these will completely defend you against the robots because they're getting much smarter and much faster than we are. Again, at uh, DevOps in Antwerp, the talk about uh, AI had some kind of scary charts, and the guy was suggesting that, you know, in the relatively near future, he didn't put an exact time frame on it, but I think he meant less than 10 years, the AIs are going to be smarter than we are. So the curve, they're getting fa faster, and of course their curve is exponential. We don't, we don't grow exponentially. So, but this will help you. This will help you to defend yourself. I think I'm just about done, but let's wake this up anyway. Yeah. Got it. This is your best chance of improving your opportunities, getting a decent job, and holding on to it. You can also, if you like, uh, participate in what we call OpenJDK, which is the actual implementation of the Java SE platform. Uh, so there is a formal open process there that you can participate in if you like. So I'm just about done. Um, I don't know if Java will last to the 25th century, but it's certainly going to last for the lifetime of your career, okay? It'll be around for at least 30 years, 40 years. Maybe Java the language will, will have changed or maybe Java the language will be superseded by another language, but the JVM itself is the important part of Java 
And these days, nobody invents new languages and, and builds their own runtime. It's, it's a stupid waste of time. The JVM has existed for 20 years. Some of the smartest engineers on the planet have been tuning it over that time, and it's there kind of for free. So Java's going to be around. And what it's going to look like 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years from now, uh, you guys can help to define that. This is not Windows. It doesn't come down from above. It comes from all of us working together. Uh, so collaboration is important. Collaboration is fun. I encourage you to participate. And I thank you for listening. We're running behind schedule, so I'm going to skip questions. I'll be around for the rest of the week, so let me know if you have any questions, but let's try and catch up.